Hi, uh, my name is, uh, you can hear me, right? Yeah. My name is Amartya Banerjee. Um, I've, this is not actually my first time in Toronto. I was here roughly 20 years ago because I was a student in Ottawa. I, uh, I went to Algonquin College, did a diploma there. And um, I left in 98, but then I came to visit my friends a few times. The last time I was here was in 2001. So I'm back in Canada after 15 years and uh, back in Toronto, roughly 20. And uh, it's good to be back. And I look forward to meeting all my friends who I made in college. So once the conference is over, that's where I'm going. I'm going to water water to catch up with my friends. Um, I'm a, what else can I say? I'm a, I became an open source, free software and open source enthusiast in college. And, uh, you know, I've been that ever since. I've, um, I've been working for the last uh, 10 years in, uh, my current employer, TNQ Books and Journals. And uh, it's been a really good fit because my boss, who's also my co-author, Eske Venkatesham, he's also an enthusiast, and so we get on well. And uh, I should feel I should mention something about them since uh, they've sent me here. Uh, a, TNQ is a publishing uh, technology and services company uh, focused on STM, Science Technology Medicine, I think that's the acronym. A uh, couple of products which uh, we, we have right now, one is called Proof Central, which is an online proofing platform. Uh, it's uh, used to service uh, 2,000 journals, and uh, what it basically does is it replaces PDF proofing with HTML proofing. And a new product which we rolled out recently is called Page Central, and what is being done here is that we use the browser to type to typeset a given Mark, markup page and what this has the potential for is making DTP redundant and uh, bringing a uh, you know, whole bunch of benefits to authors and publishers. The full scope of that has not been realized yet. Uh, TNQ does uh, copy editing, XML conversion and uh, composition services to some leading STM publishers. We process about 2 million pages per annum and uh, we accept manuscripts in doc and uh, or tech. Now, uh, yeah. So what I've developed is called a Telegram bot for. Printing LaTeX files. Uh, and I must mention here that uh, I'm a total tech newbie. I mean, I've known about it. I've never had occasion to use it because I didn't. I did a diploma, not a degree. I didn't have to write thesis, so I, I never had to use it. My, my, my co-author and my boss, he's the tech enthusiast and knowledgeable about tech, and he's been here at most presentations. So what this bot does, Telegram is a messaging program like WhatsApp or uh, Viber. And uh, this bot that I've risen, written, it. Uh, it will accept a LaTeX file submitted by a user uh, through the Telegram client, which could be either running on the mobile or the Telegram also has a web client. You could do it over the web. And uh, the bot is meant to run on a Raspberry Pi, and uh, it, uh, it's running some server software. It uh, compiles the tech file, produces a PDF, and uh, you know either using PDF tech or ZTech, and uh, it sends the PDF file back to the user and he can then view it on his phone. So how did this idea come up? Basically, uh, my co-author and me, we were brainstorming. What can you do with a Raspberry Pi? Because ever since I learned about it, I've been real enthusiastic about it. And I've tried to, even before I actually bought the hardware, I spent a lot of time you know, reading about every conceivable use of the Raspberry Pi. Someone has done some projects, someone's done the other, and you know, when I finally bought one, I went and, you know, copied the steps to do a media server. It's hooked up to my TV. So I've I've thrown away my television connection. I've uh, you know I just whatever media files I have, I, I run a program called Kodi on it and uh, you know uh, I I don't need to watch TV anymore. I just I just use that for all my music. So we were talking about we were just talking about uh, you know what we do with the Raspberry Pi, and my boss said, 
can you run tech on it? So I looked it up and sure enough, someone's running tech on it. Uh, I've got all these references in my paper. I haven't put them in the slide. But, you know. So then, uh, you know, he said, well, you know, if you can run tech on it, I have an idea for something you can do with tech on the Raspberry Pi. What if, uh, what if someone could type up a tech, you know, tech file on their mobile phone and uh, send it to the Pi, and it can either it can compile a PDF file and send it back, or it can print it out. So, uh, you know, it would be like a, it could be like a something you could run at a print shop. You know, uh, you, uh, you know, you type up your tech file, you send it, and uh, you know, at the shop where the bot is running, it will it will compile it, print it, and the guy it comes and collects his print out and. We can either do it as a, you know, either it's a free service or it's paid. That's, uh, you know, that that's that's to be decided. So, you know, we had the idea. So now, the question is, okay, how do we, how is the file to be sent? Um, you know, so my boy, my boss said initially, hey, send SMS. You know, that's that's the most convenient, right? All phones, all mobile phones have SMS. The problem is that uh, in India, at least, there's all sorts of restrictions on how many SMSs you can send with a given number, also what you can send by SMS, and uh, you know the size of the attachment. And you know every SMS you send costs money. So you know, I said, well, that's not except you know that uh, that doesn't make sense. Plus, I remember reading about all sorts of problems with you know trying to interact with SMS on a program. So that left something like WhatsApp or Viber. Uh, in my experience, uh, in my circle, people use, uh, people mostly use WhatsApp, and those who use both use WhatsApp in preference to Viber. So that seemed like a natural choice. But uh, the problem was that, uh, and I even found a, a write-up which said, hey, this is how you can use WhatsApp to you know, on the Raspberry Pi, and you know, you can use it. You know, you can communicate to the Raspberry Pi using uh, using WhatsApp. The trouble is, uh, the same article which talked about that also mentioned that uh, the, 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 the the library he, he wrote up about it uses uh, it's a library called Yauzup, and that uses a, 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 a reverse engineered API of WhatsApp called Chat API. And uh, WhatsApp actually wrote to the developer of, of Chat API saying, you know, he sent him a cease and desist letter and said, you know, threatened all sorts of legal consequences. And, uh, you know, also, you know, if every time you use it, you have to register your mobile phone. You keep doing that again and again. You're liable to, uh, you know, get yourself locked out of your WhatsApp account. So Telegram seemed like the alternative. So. Telegram, you know, unlike WhatsApp, which you know, the protocol is reverse engineered and they don't, you know, they don't want you using it. Telegram officially offers you two APIs. You, know, you can either write a full-fledged Telegram client, or you can write a Telegram bot. And uh, the third way is there's a command line uh, Telegram client, which you know, you just call it from the command line. Um, so I. Uh, you know, I, I tried all these all these techniques out, and um, I ended up going with the bot approach. Um, one ex one of the reasons is that you know uh, the bot examples were in Python, the command line examples were in Lua. I'm personally more familiar with Python, so that's what I chose. But that's not to say that one in a future implementation we won't go with the command line approach because. There are some limitations of the bot API. Uh, one thing is that if you use the bot API, uh, the largest size of file that the bot can download is 20 megabytes. Now, if a user includes references to lots of, uh, you know, raster files, graphic files, um, or you know. They're referring, it's a multi-part document. It's a single tech file which references lots and lots of other tech files. If the size reaches, we could easily run into that limitation. So uh, in that case, you know, we might have to go with a command line implementation. For now, the bot is, is what we have. 
So, what you know, I just talk about uh, you know what the learning process was. I had to you know the, the software to interact with the telling. There's there's a Python API to interact with uh, you know which is a which is internal wrapper around the Telegram API. It's called Telepot, and um, so I spent a lot of time. Reading up the API documentation, reading up, you know, reading up Teleport documentation, reading up Telegram documentation, you know, and you know, trying to, you know, code, you know, trying out the examples in the sample, and I found that you know, the uh, the function uh, provided for downloading by the bot wasn't working. Uh, I was finding that the code was just hanging, and I just had to kill the bot, and. Um, you know, initially I did a workaround where instead of using the provided function for download, I just um, I just used wget to download the file from the Telegram server. But then I looked at the source code some more, and I found that uh, a small patch to the Teleport source files makes the download function work properly. So I uh, I I've made that patch, and now download works. Uh, the patch itself is really small, it's like four lines, but the effort to figure out what it was was not trivial. Uh, I'm going to send it to the author of Teleport as soon as possible. I mean, uh, I've been, I, I think I spent more time uh, preparing the paper and the slides and preparing, you know, doing the visa presentation than actually writing the code, you know, I would have been happier <laughs> just working on developing this. But it so happened that, you know, uh, my boss said, you know, Suddenly it occurred to me that hey, the conference is there. Why don't you present and you know? So that's why I'm here. So this is the uh, user experience, uh, and as it works right now, uh, you've got to first install Teleport on your. Uh, you have to install the Telegram client on your smartphone, and. Um, Yeah, you have to install the Telegram on your smartphone, and for this you have to register and provide your mobile number for verification. So this is, you know, you use WhatsApp, you use Viber, it's the same thing. All of all these new generation of messaging, of mobile phone based messaging programs, they they tie they tie themselves to your mobile mobile phone number. That's what you use for verification. And once you have registered, uh, there's a you know you do a search, and uh, you know. It lets you you start typing it in, and you can get uh, you know it's usually for Telegram users, but you can also search for a bot. There are lots of people who have written Telegram bots, you know, which do all sorts of things. You know. So in my case, you know, I've named this bot Amor the First Bot. So you, know, you can see I'm being very <laughs> modest here. So once the result comes up and you select it, you. Um, What will happen is the button will show up here saying start. And uh, when you press that button, the um, chat session starts up. So there's a. That's the, uh, that's the attachment icon. And uh, then you select this button which says, uh, you know, which is for selecting files because. Normally, you can send a whole bunch of attachments in Telegram. You can send, uh, you know, photos, media, GPS location, your current GPS location, sound files. So in this case, we're sending a general document. This is basically how Telegram classifies all these items which you can send. So a general document is what is not one of the other ones. And you navigate through the uh, file interface. And, uh, well, this is where I am, and I've selected a selected a LaTeX file, and uh, it uploads, and uh, the sub, the bot runs, and it sends you a compiled PDF file, and there's an indicator here which says to download it, meaning it's it's gone to the server. Uh, so, in this case, server server. I mean, my bot is a client from the viewpoint of. Telegram and its servers, but it's a server from the point of view of the user. So, uh, just have to keep that in mind. And uh, 
where you can see it's uh, uh, downloading process is on, and then you select it. This is what's there on my phone, and this is a, this is a file. So right now I haven't implemented the printing part yet. It just sends the PDF file back, but uh, even this has use cases. I mean, you could, for example, uh, you know, assuming you have small enough thumbs, you could type up, let's say, uh, a chess move file or uh, you know you could type up some music file and uh, you know I've, I've 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 made those work personally uh, these files of course are not written by me i uh, i just googled and uh, you know found an example pasted it um, the reference where i found it is in the it's going to be in the paper so uh, you know this was someone providing an example of you know how to do display chess move and this is zooming in with the uh, PDF viewer. And yeah, this is what it looks like when the download is complete. And uh, well, this is, you know, you use a, in this case I think this is an app called uh, Droid Edit and uh, you know, typing up a basic, uh, a basic, uh, Tech file. So right now it's a prototype. Um, you know, I mean, if you if you sneeze, it'll it'll crash. Uh, you know, uh, like I said, you know, maybe maybe if, if this goes well enough, and you know, I'm invited back next year. Then in between, I'll have time to you know make it more functional. And uh, also the other thing is, I had actually brought my Raspberry Pi with me, and I was. I, you know, I spent the lunch break trying to get it to work, but uh, unfortunately, it's uh, it's not working. Good thing I had the screenshots. Um, I was I was going to show it to you and you know have an additional wow factor, but uh, I have to figure out why that's happening. Either the either the API has changed, or possibly because because when you when you when you sign up to create a bot, you have to chat in turn with another Telegram bot. And they give you a credential. They give you a string which you're supposed to use as a credential, and you're supposed to keep secret. It's possible that because I'm in Canada and not India, the server thinks I'm faking it or something, or the credential being stolen. Or maybe, alternatively, it's a problem of you know the Wi-Fi network here. Maybe Telegram considers it insecure and is therefore rejecting it. This, this message was unpleasant surprise. I guess I should have checked it last night, but. You know, and after flying nearly 24 hours, you know, <laughs> and uh, you know, nine hour, like ten and a half, nine and a half hour time difference, I was just knocked out. So, additional functionality. Right now, all it can do is it'll it will compile a, it will take a single file, and uh, it will compile it. So, naturally, what one would like to do in the future is, you know, it should be able to handle a multi-part file document. So, one idea I have is to, you know expect a zip file and uh, you know have the name of the zip file be the same as the name require that the name of the zip file be the same as the, uh, the name of the main main tech file inside the zip file and use that to reference things and call it uh, also um, you know implement the print functionality and also give an option to say for the user, you know, if the user says he wants to print it, then he'll be given he'll be given the preview, and he'll be have an option to say yes, this is you know this is what I expect it to look like, so that it then the actual print will happen. We don't want the user saying no, this is not what it looks like, uh, this is not what I expected it to look like, and I'm not going to pay for the print. So you know, we send him the you know we let him approve it first, and you know if it looks like what he expects, uh, then we. Uh, then only then we, we print it. And uh, also, right now, if there are errors, the bot will die. So naturally, we have to make sure that you know the bot will, you know, that the bot will keep running. It will send back a suitable error message to the user so that he can figure out okay, if there's a typo, his include, you know, his, his paths are not correct, something wrong in the zip file. And uh, we probably have to, you know, uh, Telegram already provides you a whole bunch of information about the, you know. The user's ID and uh, you know the chat session and uh, time and things like that. 
So maybe you have to look at some way of keeping track of that in some kind of a database and to say, you know, okay, who's the guy who sent the file and did he approve it? And you know, so that uh, all these things are taken care of. So this is all for the future. This is all up for reference, all up for research. Like I said, it's not uh, production ready. Uh, right now, uh, it should, uh, you know, Right now, late, well, yeah, basically what happens is it's a Python program which calls LaTeX MK and uh, it runs it on the file. And uh, if it fails for some reason, it should, uh, you know, it should send appropriate error message back. It shouldn't crash. And uh, sometimes, I've, I, while I was doing my research, I, I think I've, I found a multi-part LaTeX document which was, I think that, that, guy, that person only intended to produce PostScript, not PDF. So, uh, in which case, we should produce the postscript. We should assume that he only wants to produce PDF. And um, on the other hand, you know, maybe he specifically put a thing in the declaration that he wants it to be compiled by Zlate because right now it's just a data MK hyphen PDF hyphen shell escape. So, those are things to be done in the future. So, one option is you know maybe to parse the file, but for now I want to cheat. I'm thinking of cheating by you know. I'll first call it PDF, call it with PDF LaTeX. If that fails, I'll call it with Z LaTeX. If that fails, I'll try to compile it with PostScript. If that fails, I give up and I say, try again. So that's that's an idea I have for how I'm going to implement this. Because I don't want to start parsing the file myself. You know, that's not my domain. And uh, also, I found a case because if you look at the music packages, there's music tech and Harmony and I think was Sim, and there's also one called ABC. Now, I had problems with that because uh, the example file I found for a ABC, it would, you know, it would, you know, the PDF file would be produced, but the actual typeset music was not going in there. And I ended up looking through all the command line output. And uh, the funny thing is LaTeX MK was returning zero, but obviously, file was not being produced. So it turns out that this program called ABC M2PS, uh, it is returning a non-zero error code, but the ABC package in tech is, is kind of running anyway. It's, so it's, 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 returning a, it's returning, returning zero when the program is invoked has not returned, has, has not succeeded. So the, my choices are either to, you know, for ABC, not uh, you know, not just look at the error code, but to look at the output syntax when I know that the ABC M2PS program uh, has failed, or I just um, or I just persuade the authors to change and check the error code correctly. And uh, the last thing is, you know, now nowadays the you know the internet is you know you've got to be very careful, right? You can't just accept any input that the user gives you. You have to, you know, there's you know. If your input sanitization is not done, if you, you know, this is the era of SQL injection attacks, cross-site scripting attacks, uh, you know, buffer overruns, arbitrary remote, uh, arbitrary remote file execution. So, and this, this is not my area of expertise. I need to do more research on how to, you know, how to really sanitize the input, you know, make sure the mind type is what the user says it is. Because the Telegram API, uh, certain fields are not compulsory, but Telegram sends them anyway, but if somebody sends a file without declaring a mind type, I should refuse to proceed because you know there's, there's something suspicious. Uh, yeah, like I said, I uh, when I at the time I wrote the paper, this was I had developed the code and it was running on my laptop. Uh, after that, I actually bought the Raspberry Pi and. Uh, got it to run on that. And I was hoping to demo it today, but um, unfortunately, it didn't work. And also, right now, it, it, you, have to, have to, you have to log in and start it up manually. So I need to look into how to make it auto start. So uh, yeah, so that's, you know, this is, you know, I've described why, how, how we got the idea, what problems I went through, and uh, fixing it. and. Uh, what we need to do in the future, and uh, that's it. Uh, 
I'm in, I'm, I'm in time, yeah. Yeah, okay. we don't have time for questions. Okay, yeah. I'll tell you one thing. We've got a couple minutes for questions, so I'll let you choose people. Yeah. Uh, Telegram can keep track. Telegram, the API, it keeps track. You know, for for every user and every chat session, that that information Telegram has. Uh, but yeah, right now it's like I said, the prototype is single threaded. Um, there, there is Teleport, which is the software I'm using, does have uh, options to write it in multi-thread mode and to write asynchronous mode. But uh, that is in Python, th written in the Python 3 API, whereas my code is Python 2. <coughs> so I need to brush up on Python 3 and how to do asynchronous programming in Python 3 so that I can use that API. So yeah, if if ever this actually becomes successful enough for this this to be an issue, then naturally we will rewrite it. Well, you know, it's it's low power, and uh, yeah, the challenge was part of it. You know, what can I do in the Raspberry Pi? And it's low power, and you know, you, you can fit it somewhere small and discreet, and you know, set it up to run automatically. And uh, you know, you know, on the Raspberry original Raspberry Pi, it, it would have been possible. You know, that was when somebody ran tech on it. But now the Raspberry Pi three, which is what I have, is even more power. So, you know. It's 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 as powerful as uh, it's, it's probably more powerful than many desktops we had in the 90s or early 2000s, and it's small form factor and you know minimal power and it's cheap, so you know it could be ubiquitous. Yeah. Um, your use case, the way you've described it, is that the receiver, the recipient, only gets the PDF. Uh, that's that's how it works right now. But originally, uh, SKV's idea was for it to be uh, you know. For him to get the print, he, he said, "Hey, you know, we, we, you know, have a service. He sends a file, and then he goes and collects the print out from the Dropbox." But that's not been implemented yet. So, what I'm envisaging with the use case, a variant of the use case, especially for chess problems, is the source comes along with the paper through Telegram, so you can modify and get the return. Let's say you're having an exchange. Uh, yeah, that could that could that could that could work. That could work. I mean, like I said, for now, you know. Yeah, the idea we had was you type up the move and it send it back. But yeah, we could you know so we could we could make it a, we could make we could make it an intermediary so that people could play. Not not an intermediary, peer to peer. Right. But you have that conversation, a round trip conversation. So you send your move as a, as represented in the tech file. The recipient receives the board as a PDF. It receives the the tech file, adjusts it for the move. Sends it back via Telegram, so you're having an interactive chess game. Yeah, both I, I, media and tech. I don't see why not. If that's a good idea. I'll uh, you know, talk about implementing it. Out of time. I think okay. we need to stop now. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. All right. Next up is uh, Norbert Kleining, who's going to be talking about building a wall. No, that's another guy. <laughs> uh, he is going to be talking okay. about security, though. Security improvements nice. in the tech life and installers. You don't need any more? No, I have, oh, you have, you have, have this remote oh. for the for the Building a firewall. Sorry, I just told you. I need this one. Yeah, yeah, please take that. Uh, Hackers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
Who's controlling the presentation? Yeah, what the hell is that? Okay, Norbert Breining from Japan. Um, yeah, I think most people know me from the Tech Life team. I want to report about recent changes we did in 2016. I think I'm standing everywhere in the way, I guess, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's about security improvements. So what's the, the, the point? I mean, it's the first time that I put the logo down there because otherwise the last row don't, I, I think people can hear me. Ah, for the recording. Uh, I hate this. Okay, um, yeah, I put the logo down there because otherwise the back rows cannot see anything. So, what I want to talk about is the status, what we had up to 2015, take like 2015, possible attack vectors, and well, and then, well, how we tried to fix somehow the security in take life. Now, okay, <coughs> anyone, uh, probably, is there anyone here who is using Tech Live or Mac Tech? Uh, probably some users. Maybe some of you have seen with 2016 strange new messages appearing now and then. B very uh, polite. I tried to make them as small as possible. Um, so what was the status up to 2015? Is we had we had in our database. I don't want to speak about the details. Information about the size and uh, a checksum, a MD5 checksum. <laughs> So that looked somehow convincing. Yeah, you know? well, that looks. We can we can check something. Unfortunately, we never used it. Um, <laughs> we only used it to restart an uh, so aborted installation to check whether the downloaded uh, packages or so the containers somehow are the same. So that's the only. But besides this, we never checked anything. Well. Um, Neither for Tech Live Manager, so if you install new packages or an initial installation. So that, that was, well, well, it was like this for, for well, 20 years or something. <laughs> so no, no reason to change. <laughs> anyway, so the question was that puzzled me about do we need better security? Now, that is a question that is open. We can also all say, well, we are, we are well, the tech, everyone is friendly. What I was thinking about is what are possible attack vectors? Now, I mean, what could happen? So let's look at compromise one seat and mirror. I, and I mean one, you know, I mean one putting somewhere, I don't know, I don't care. We don't know who is managing this seat and mirror. Yeah? <laughs> what is the next thing you do? You exchange the PDF tech binary with a slightly change that installs a crypto virus. Well, we have a certain percentage of uh, Windows users that might run PDF tech at some point in their life. Uh, well, I think you can enjoy them afterwards with your data is gone, unless you pay or not. Well, this is easily possible. I mean, our, our mirrors, are this, we have no access to the CTAN mirroring, and we cannot guarantee that we check once a week whether mirrors are outdated, but we cannot guarantee that the user is just for the list of mirrors we are s shipping out, but users are free to use any mirror. And, well, if this one is just a few days out, and, well, well. okay. So, while we could do easily, that would be a nice start, verification of checksums with the MD5 sums. That was actually in Tech Life Critical for those who follow this. Uh, before 2016 was released for about three months, I guess, for, but we never pushed it out because it was, well, it was testing there. Okay, so assume we have this one, well, we can do a different attack. Well, compromise one Tech Life mirror as before, easily. Exchange to binary as before. Well, there's one more step. Well, you now, if you check MD5 sums, we have we well we have to tweak the container a bit. But MD5 is weak. We know this, so we can actually ch tweak the checksum even if we change the binary in there. Um, but it's a bit harder because we use tar and exact compression, so it might be a bit more difficult. But I I guess there is a way around it. Well, and the same way you can enjoy your money floating, flowing in in bitcoins, okay? 
Um, well, this, were, this is the status up to 2015. No countermeasures. We cannot do anything against this. If this happens anywhere on the seat and mirror, well, we are in 2015. Okay. I mean, there is more. Compromise. Let's get one stop more. Compromise one mirror. I mean, I say compromising, but there's an easier way. Who is checking? I'm setting up an, a, a nice little server with high, good connectivity. I just mirror Zeta, which is very easily. I just publish this information. I probably in half a year you get enough users, if, especially if you put it up in a good location with good connectivity. Well, exchange PDF, like you know this already. You just uh, take live database the checksum, well, because then you can free, you can ship whatever you want anyway, right? I mean, if you can change the checksum, then our programs would, the installer would, yeah, would check the checksum, say, oh, wow, checksum fix, so download this not fail, but, well, anything else doesn't help. So, yes, this is, um, we still have, don't, uh, well, 2015, no countermeasures. So what are the two points what I wanted to show? There are two things, independent things, we have to deal here. The one is integrity and the other authenticity. Integrity means, well, what you downloaded is actually what we want you to download. Yeah? There is nothing tweaked around there. Yeah? So this is what we normally do with checksums. And MD5 is too weak. It doesn't work. Uh, can be tempered, there are enough attacks on this, so we switch to uh, also SSH, SSH A 512. Uh, that should suffice for some time, I guess. And authenticity, well, it means are these packages actually coming from us? I mean, from the Tech Life team, or, well, from someone else? Well, this is something, how do you check this? This is something where you need cryptographic signatures. There is no easy way around this. And yeah, so we had these integrity measures in testing, and this was added well in the testing phase of Tech Life 2016. So, how does it look like? Well, in general, I speak now only of the Tech Life Manager, but it applies in the same way, it's the same code pass into the installer. So, the Tech Life Manager downloads the Tech Life database, you know, that you have probably seen sometimes, and it verifies the authenticity of this. Tech Life database, and then, well, it knows this is the real, this is a nice <coughs> one, it means it contains the correct checksums, and then it checks the integrity of the downloaded containers. And then only after that installs the package. So as I mentioned before, this is partially new, it was in testing for some time, was completely rewritten actually, and this is completely new in 2016. So. How does this run? Well, the verification of authenticity was, well, there's the Tech Life database. It's a long text file. You know, I mean, it's, I don't know, a few 10 megabytes now at the moment, what is normally downloaded. Well, what we create is again a checksum file. This is a very standard method. Well, it's just a simple file that contains 128 hex digits and the name of the file, but the name is actually not important. And then, the int so this is, this is one, and then what we use, we create a, a GPG signature, so a... Oh. Sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, we create a PG, also GNU PG signature of this, and this was used to verify authenticity. Okay, so what are the signing keys? So I don't go into details of how, how asymmetric cryptography works here. I, I hope that can work out. So what we have, we have a signing key. This is the signing key. It is signed well by itself and by Carl and my keys. So both of them are easily accessible via key servers. Mine is in the Debian developer key ring. So they all are easy to find. And um, Actually, I mean, for those who are interested in this kind of stuff, we don't use the main key for signing, but we use a sub key, and the main key is completely offline. So that means that even if the if the tax server in Denmark is compromised, we can just revoke the sub key and create a new sub key, and uh, nothing has to change. So that's that's just safety measures because we have to automate all this. Um, so. A few questions, why not sign directly? Why did we do this checksum and then do the, also first the checksum of the database and then the signing of the checksum file? Well, it's just a factor of 10 in the speed because if, you, the, if the GNU BG has to run through megabytes of text code and then sign this, it's as good as signing the checksum. 
Um, it's also because this is the way how it runs in Debian, and this is uncomfortable with, so it's easy. Um, it might not be needed, because we do this anyway on the tax server, and anyway, once a day, and it's one second, or one <laughs> point one second against point one one second. So, I mean, well, but it just happens. So, the question is more why 512, uh, SHA 512, well, there would be an option for 256 or something, but, well, if we jump to a bigger crypt, also, uh, check some lengths, then we want to go some, for something that keeps, uh, well, keeps us safe for at least a few years in the future. And I guess 512 will hopefully work until I'm not programming DI anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no? You think it will be, happen faster? I think we are ahead of more law with respect to well, Anyway, anyway, I mean, the code is so that I can switch the checksum yeah. anytime. <laughs> <laughs> so, and the integrity, well, so you might ask why don't we sign the, the data of the, the containers or something? Well, this is not necessary. Because we have a strong checksum and we have verified that the database we download contains the correct information, we only have to check whether the downloaded actual package has the correct checksum. So that's quite easy, and well, that is easy to check. Okay, why well, sufficient that already said this. Um, we actually check also the size. This is just historically, it was just in the code, and but I might throw this out, because there is no reason to check the size and the checksum, because if the checksum, well, if the size does not fit, then the checksum will also not fit. Okay, a bit about, you might wonder uh, why we don't have GNUBG in the tech life distribution. There are several reasons for this. <laughs> Carl wants to run away immediately. <laughs> okay, first we don't want to support it. Not compile, not support, nor ship anything. Because, I mean, it's a complicated piece of software. And, yeah, that's made it complicated. I mean, we have private space copies of utilities like wget or etc or tar for several, I mean for those for all architectures, um, but yeah, for GNUBG we were discussing, but there's a much more important reason. There are crazy laws out there called the Vazenar Agreement, which it's, it's not even about importing, but about exporting cryptography. So, I mean, if we are creating DVDs and then sending them to maybe France, yeah, I'm not sure what, what the status of France now is because they are a bit complicated, but France has a crazy law that you're not allowed to import this kind of stuff unless you have a special exemption clause, which we don't have. So we don't want to get into these troubles. I mean, legal troubles are not fun, and this is not funny either. Um, so we just kept this out of tech life. The infrastructure is there. It's easy to run um, on Unix-like also operating systems. Just install GNUBG. And the system will automatically find and use this. So either version 1 or 2, both are fine. There's no problem. And for Windows, I set up, because, well, I'm not the tag, I'm just private. Uh, I set up a private repository for Windows user, because for them it's more, as a bit more hard to get a working GBT. So people can install from this repository on Windows easily and get a, a running, I, I think. Actually, not only Windows, also Mac OS, I forgot. We have also Mac OS there. And so it works for Windows and Mac OS. They can get easy access. As they use the same, so it's not usually usable. Like many of these hidden, it's, it's somewhere kept aside. So it will not interfere in case you have a different installation. As I mentioned, Windows and Mac. It is already supported by the Tech Life utility in, in, on Mac, so it already asks you, do you want, verify, want verification? Very simple click, and then it's installed automatically. Well, the other distributions in, on, on Unix space, they, most of them have GNUBG 1 or 2. And yeah, so without much interference, practically everyone can check if they want. Okay, what are the problems? It was not so easy, as you think. Well, first is computing checksums. Now you would say that is easy, right? I mean, there are thousands of programs. So we use this Perl module, which has a, a binary part, which is a compiled part, that makes it fast. That's nice. Unfortunately, macOS is, what should I say? Um, yeah, their Perl is, um, 
Yeah, okay. It's so old that they not even have this simple module and it's not running. So that brought us a certain level of problems. I mean, the newest Macs have this, but there are enough Macs that don't have this. Anyway, we used after this, we tried a lot of implementations. So there is a pure Perl implementation, there is Lua implementation. All of them are horribly slow. There is no way to get fast. I mean, if you want to compute the checksum of a big package, like, what is a big package? I mean, some font package, yeah, well, the stock documentation, it just takes ages, you know? I mean, minutes for one package. Yeah, so this is not what we want to have. So what we try now, I mean, the end solution that we came up, we are just, yeah, trying out what is there. So we try first, if this is available, if there's not, we check whether the OpenSSL program is available and use OpenSSL program to compute checksum. And then there are another two programs that are sometimes available on, on, on Mac OS, the Shazam. And well, we hope one of these programs is available. If not, then we say, well, we cannot check anything, sorry. Okay, what were the other problems in the starting run of it is where user complaints. Well, every time one byte of output changes, a user cries out. So, <laughs> Well, when there suddenly were big warnings, you are downloading from a not verified source or something, then they were, Wah! so they were crying out. Okay, we agree, maybe the first few versions were a bit strong in their warnings. Um, so we have reduced the level of information and, and warning level to a quite, I would say, unspectacular level. So, uh, well, or let's say nearly invisible to user. Now, how does it look like if you ever tried it on the command line? If you just, well, do, uh, I just do it here on my local, I have a checkout here. Well, it tells you here at the end verified or not verified. This is all. I mean, uh, well, users, if they complain about this, then I cannot do more. But bef before we had quite nice warnings here, now <laughs> it's just verified and not verified. Um, well, as I said here, if it's not found or it's so. The point is if no GNU which is found, then we just say not verified. We still give a, give a big fat warning if the verification fails, of course. I mean, if the downloaded file and then we check it with GNU and there's an error, well, then it could really be tampering. So then there's a big warning. But if, well, we cannot, because GNU is not available or something, then we just say not verified. <coughs> Similar works also for micro repositories. Uh, what I have added in the, well, I think it's already out in, in one of, after the release, was how to support multiple keys. So by now, so Tech Life Manager used only the key we, so our Tech Life distribution key. So it was difficult for alternative repositories to use this system because, well, they don't have our key to sign, of course, and we, we will not pass them on. So what I added is an action that you can add keys, a public key, and list them, remove them, this kind of stuff. And this is already actively in use. So Marcus Kohn use it for his Koma script for his repository, he has his own private key. We use it for the, tech, the Japanese tech development unit. We have our own. So this is already used and I think it's quite useful to, well, there are some testing repositories out there that we can provide a certain level of verification. Okay, further plans, there are not many. I have to say, really, I, I, one idea I had in one of the bus rides yesterday or the day before yesterday was um, for extra check, one could actually think about downloading the checksum from the tag mirror. So you, it might sound, what, what is the reason for this? But we could get out of, so the squeezes get, or, or, or I mean, if you directly sign some, I, I have to think about if this is, an option, but it is too much overhead for them. Then, as I mentioned, we were directly sign instead of signing the checksum. This is this factor 10. It is, for us, serving on the tag server is not a problem, but the user has the same problem. So the user has to verify it also, so it takes also time. And then also, well, don't check file size because this is just useless overhead. And then your suggestions. I'm always waiting for new suggestions for the Tech Life Manager. And well, that's all from my side about security improvements. Thanks a lot.
the checksum by adding an x to MD5 is, can be faked. And I, I'm not interested in trying out, but I'm sure with, <laughs> with reasonable time and normal computer equipment, you don't need supercomputers anymore to fake MD5. That's what we are doing right first. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's an interesting suggestion with the two checksums. I agree that, I mean, if you have two different uh, so checksum methods, then, I mean, it's practically impossible to fake both of them at the same time. On the other hand, there is one addition, because we use tar and xz and also bail out if, if there is a decompression problem. This, it makes it already very hard. So I'm coming back to your question, I'm not sure if it's, whether it's easy to fake MD5 of an XZ compressed file. So this is something, I, because I mean, XZ has a very high compression rate, so there is not much, well, playground to do around. I mean, a plain tar file is much easier, but an XZ, this is hard. So I agree, this is a good idea. I mean, I, I will think about this, might be that we just add MD5, which we have already, I mean, back in there and use both, because, well, that would be an easier method. And also the, the suggestion, right, is correct that we check only the size, don't keep the size check because it's fast, right? Related to this, do you have a mechanism in place where if you get a checksum failure after a download, you automatically try another mirror to see if you get success? Or mm, no, no, not by now. Um, I don't know. I raised this. No, we definitely I not a different mirror. So that, 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 I'm, that is currently too complicated to try different mirrors because there's also the problem with synchronization. You know, the CTAN mirrors are not all synchronized at the same time. So that means already we had these problems that people in the Tech Life utility uses to download the database, shows the information, and then grasps a different mirror for actually downloading. But then you get wrong information. So. Um, putting this into the same program, this is slightly complicated. So I don't want to go this way. I mean, people can restart the program. I mean, <laughs> if you don't have upgrade ETs, you don't do this every two seconds. So that's. Um, I, I would suggest that for further questions, you have various vectors of attack on Norbert. <laughs> 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 we need to get moving on. Okay, Thank sorry. you very much.